Okay. Um, I'm going to get started. Uh, last time, uh, we completed Hume's argument in favor of uh, moral sentimentalism over moral rationalism. Now, according to the traditional debate between the rationalists and sentimentalists, uh, this was an issue about whether it was by means of reason or internal sentiment that we distinguish between uh, vice and virtue. Um, now, within Hume's framework, uh, that becomes the question of whether it's by means of the relations of ideas or uh, by means of impressions that we distinguish between uh, vice and virtue. And rationalism, so conceived, faced really two basic problems, right? Uh, first, moral judgments influence the will, okay? Uh, but it's hard to understand how knowledge of relations could determine the will. The second problem was uh, a problem of overgeneralization. Uh, the relevant relations, recall, had to obtain between perceptions in the mind and external objects uh, alone. Uh, however, any relations you pick, are it's hard to see how they couldn't also obtain among perceptions in the mind alone or uh, among external objects alone. And if that's right, moral, uh, moral rationalism over generates. Uh, it counts as virtuous or vicious things that are manifestly not. And for these reasons, Hume uh, favored uh, moral uh, sentimentalism over uh, moral uh, rationalism. Um, okay, uh, <clears throat> now, Hume thus uh, maintains that the distinction between vice and virtue is determined by impressions. Now recall there are two classes of impressions, impressions of sensations and impressions of reflections. The latter being uh, uh, things like passions and sentiments and the former being things like sensory experience. We know from the case of willful murder that we can't see the vice of willful murder. So the relevant impressions that Hume has in mind are the impressions of reflection. That is to say, Hume maintains that moral distinctions are uh, determined by uh, these. Now, specifically, right, Hume claims that uh, uh, moral distinctions just are, just are particular pains or pleasures determined upon the general uh, view or survey. So a virtuous action will, uh, when you're contemplating a virtuous action uh, uh, from the general view or survey, this will give rise to the agreeable impression of uh, moral approbation. And uh, for, if from a general uh, uh, view or survey, you're contemplating a vicious action, this will give rise to the disagreeable impression of moral uh, disapprobation. Now, one thing I didn't really emphasize last time, uh, but it's worth underscoring, is this phrase, upon the general view or survey, right? Uh, I think what Hume has in mind is, we're meant to be contemplating uh, the relevant uh, actions, passions, or characters from, as it were, an impartial perspective, okay? Uh, so uh, imagine then uh, uh, being a third person looking on something that's transpiring. You're not involved with any of the parties, right? So you've got an impartial perspective. And if the actions of one of the parties uh, gives rise to an agreeable uh, 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 impression of uh, moral approbation, then that action is, is virtuous. So upon the general view or survey is meant to be um, from an impartial perspective, right? And it's only these feelings uh, of moral pain and pleasure from an impartial perspective uh, that are really determining vice or, or, or virtue. Um, now, uh, one last thing, uh, moral 
pleasures and pains, remember, were a distinctive kind of pleasure or pain, right? Not any uh, pleasure or pain determines virtue or vice. Um, uh, rather, uh, uh, moral pleasures and pains are going to differ in kind from, say, the pleasure one takes in a good bottle of wine or uh, a roast hog. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, since moral distinctions just are particular pains or pleasures occasioned upon the general view or survey, to explain right, our distinctions uh, between vice and virtue, it suffices to explain the circumstances that occasions moral uh, approbation and disapprobation. Uh, and you might ask, well, are the principles that explain this uh, natural or not? Well, for Hume, remember last time, uh, this doesn't really have a straightforward answer because there's a number of distinguishable senses of natural. In one sense, natural contrasts with the miraculous. Uh, well, not only is the distinction between vice and virtue not miraculous, um, uh, 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 <clears throat> um, but, you know, so is everything else, right? Uh, in another sense, natural contrasts with unusual, okay? Uh, but, you know, look, the distinction between vice and virtue is not unusual in this sense, right? Hume observes that there was never a nation in the world nor a single person in any nation who was utterly lacking in the moral sense, even villains, okay? Uh, in another sense, natural contrasts with artificial. Now, again, it's important to recall the intended contrast. Natural here is not being contrasted with the unreal or the fake, but rather with what is the product of human artifice. So Hume claims that certain virtues, such as uh, benevolence, are natural. Um, um, uh, other virtues, such as justice, are artificial. So while the moral approbation we feel towards benevolent acts is natural, the moral approbation we feel towards just acts is partly the result of artifice, and specifically it's the result of human uh, convention. Uh, and uh, natural virtues, right, they're going to include things like, um, uh, they're going to include things like benevolence, generosity, uh, 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 charity, uh, love of life, kindness to children. Artificial virtues are going to include justice, fidelity, honesty, and um, uh, chastity, although uh, Hume uh, may have been uh, uh, exercising a bit of irony there. Now, we saw that natural virtues had two important features. First, natural virtues are really yeah, the best way to think about them is that they're implanted instincts. Why are we uh, kind, naturally disposed to be kind to children, right? Because that's something instinctual, right? Uh, and, and these involve behavioral dispositions that are somehow native to the human frame. Uh, specifically, they involve dispositions to perform certain types of actions under certain circumstances. So the natural virtue of kindness to children would involve, among other things, the disposition to uh, feed a child if the child is hungry. Now, uh, the second uh, feature is that the manifestation of a natural virtue always results in at least some good. So each performance of the relevant type of action and the relevant type of circumstance is going to result in some good. So if kindness moves you to feed a hungry child, then the action results in some good. The, the hunger of the child is abated, at least for now. Now, in contrast, right, the artificial virtues are gonna differ in both these respects, right? Artificial virtues are not implanted instincts. Uh, rather, they, uh, artificial virtues involve dispositions to behave in accordance with a general scheme or convention. 
uh, and observances of this general scheme or convention are too uh, various and complex to be the result of distinct behavioral dispositions that are native to the human frame. Uh, second, right, the manifestation of an artificial uh, virtue uh, doesn't invariably result in some good. It's not the case that every single observance of uh, the general scheme benefits either the private individual or uh, the public. Justice, for example, may require repaying a debt to an enemy or someone will use those funds uh, to some malicious end contrary to the public good. So it's the general compliance with the scheme or convention that benefits the public and not any particular observance of that general scheme. Now, <clears throat> justice is Hume's central example of an artificial virtue. And let me just sort of sketch out the structure of what's happening uh, from here on out. In this first section of uh, part two of uh, book three, Hume's going to establish his main negative conclusion. Hume's going to argue that justice could not be a natural virtue. That's today's topic. Uh, in the second section of uh, part two, Hume gives his positive account of justice as an artificial virtue. Now, Hume's positive account has two parts. The first part is a genealogy of justice. Hume's going to explain the motives and circumstances that first established the conventions of justice. And the second stage is an account of the moral beauty of just acts. So he's going to give us a, uh, he's going to give us a uh, separate uh, explanation of uh, um, why, right, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, observances of these conventions have merit and are the object of moral approbation. Uh, now, here's an interesting feature, right? Notice that the original motive to justice is not the principle that bestows merit upon just acts. Uh, that's an important further difference between natural and artificial virtues. Uh, with respect to the natural virtues, the motive to virtuous action is what bestows merit upon that action. So again, consider kindness to children. When you feed a hungry child, the motive is kindness, and it is the amiableness of this action. It's being motivated by kindness that bestows merit upon that action. Uh, and <clears throat> with artificial virtues, however, Again, the original motive uh, for virtuous action is distinct from the principle that bestows merit upon that action, okay? And uh, uh, we'll be coming back to this. But uh, today's, uh, uh, today's uh, we're going to look at this negative argument. We're gonna look at why Hume thinks justice could not be an uh, a natural virtue. Uh, Wow, I've got the title really wrong. Justice is not an artificial virtue. Should read justice is not a natural virtue. My apologies. Um, so let's begin with the negative case. Why does Hume deny that justice is a natural virtue? Um, uh, Treaties 3.2.1 is dedicated to establishing this negative case. Now, the overall structure of Hume's argument is relatively clear. I've got it up here on, on the slide for, for you. Uh, although it's going to be controversial to how to exactly interpret certain transitions in that argument. Um, uh, so let me just very uh, briefly uh, go through this. So all virtuous actions, derive their merit only from virtuous motives. The virtuous motive could not be the regard to the virtue of the action, a kind of generalized sense of duty, since that's going to involve a vicious circularity. So there has to be an independent motive distinct from this sense of duty for any virtuous action. We result ourselves with 
natural affections, and that means motives that are available in uh, the rude and natural state of humankind, such as self-love or public and private benevolence, no motive sufficient to establish justice can be found. So there could be no motive to just action independent of a regard to the justice of that action. Again, this generalized sense of duty. So Hume concludes, unless nature has established a sophistry, uh, justice must be an artificial virtue. Now, it's not yet clear how to interpret the reasoning in the final stage of the argument. But look, it does suggest the argument's supposed to be a reductio ad absurdum of the claim that justice is a natural virtue. And if you're not familiar with that vocabulary, what that means is you take a thesis, you assume it for the sake of argument, and then you drive some contradiction or internal incoherence and conclude that thesis is false. So Hume is in effect in this discussion assuming that uh, justice is a uh, natural virtue and then uh, trying to establish uh, some uh, contradiction and conclude that it couldn't be a uh, natural virtue. Now, but before we can understand the reductio, we first have to understand the nature of the circularity that was introduced into at the second stage of the argument. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the claim that justice is a natural virtue uh, is reduced to absurdity in part due to the incoherence of reasoning in a circle. So we need to try to understand the circularity in the second stage of Hume's argument uh, and uh, how this can give rise to an incoherence sufficient to underwrite the intended reductio. Uh, but look, before we can understand the circularity uh, and how this might produce some kind of incoherence sufficient to drive a reductio, we first have to understand Hume's claim that all virtuous actions derive their merit from virtuous motives, because it's going to play a key role in generating that circle. Okay, okay so that's the overall structure of the argument. And now for the remainder of the lecture, I'm going to go through and talk about uh, the individual part, parts of it. So let's see. <clears throat> now, uh, we've seen that for Hume, the objects of moral evaluation are actions, sentiments, or character. Only those things can be virtuous or vicious. Uh, other things cannot. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, in this section, Hume's going to qualify this claim. To be sure, actions can be judged virtuous or vicious, but only derivatively, right? So an action is virtuous or vicious only if the motive is virtuous or vicious. Uh, the action inherits its virtue or vice from the virtue or vice of the motive or passion that prompted that action. And later on, he's going to even uh, qualify this doctrine further. It's relatively stable configurations of passions uh, and sentiments, that is to say, characters that are the primary objects of moral uh, evaluation. And it's this feature of Hume's ethics that makes it a virtue theory, placing Hume in a tradition that includes Aristotle before him and uh, Nietzsche after him. Now, an action can have merit. It can be you know, the genuine object of moral approval or moral approbation, as Hume puts it but only, he says, when considered as a sign for the motive that produced it. It's the motive that's the object of moral approbation. It's the motive that's primarily got merit. And an action considered by itself, independently of its motive, lacks merit in the radical sense of not really even being a candidate for uh, moral uh, evaluation. So here we see Hume claiming the external performance has no merit. We must look within to find the uh, moral quality. 
uh, he continues, this we cannot do directly and uh, therefore fix our attention on actions as on external signs, but these actions are still considered as signs and the ultimate object of our praise and approbation is the motive that produced them. Well, <clears throat> not only is the uh, motive the primary object of moral approbation when we praise a person for acting as virtue requires, but it's also the primary object of moral disapprobation when we blame a person uh, for not acting as virtue requires. So we blame a person who does not act virtuously for not being moved by the um, uh, relevant virtuous motive. Um, now, Hume's going to talk about this in a certain way. Uh, uh, so when Hume uh, uh, so when malice, say, uh, moves uh, a person to give a hungry child a stone instead of a loaf of bread, uh, Hume's going to say they display a want of natural affection uh, for the child and so is blamable on that account. Now, notice that Humean, distinctively Humean charge, a want of natural affection, uh, What's being criticized is the absence of the virtuous motive, right? <clears throat> uh, contrast this with cases where the virtuous motive is present and here's Hume, though checked in its operation by some circumstances unknown to us. In such cases, uh, he says, we're not, we don't readily blame the person for not acting as virtue requires. Uh, so it's the person's motivation and not the action, again, that's the primary object of moral approbation. Now, so far, there are claims about the objects of moral approbation and disapprobation, right? Uh, they answer, the question is, well, what are the objects of moral approbation or what has merit or demerit? Well, it's actions produced by certain motives that are the objects of moral approbation and disapprobation. But look, there's another question that a moral scientist might be asking here. Uh, they might be asking, well, what makes it the case that something is the object of moral approbation or, or what bestows merit or demerit upon something? And having established that an action has merit and is the object of moral approbation, only when considered as a sign for the motive that produced it, a moral scientist might seek an explanation of this and a natural hypothesis immediately suggests itself. It's the motive that produced the action that bestows merit upon that action and makes it the object of uh, uh, moral approbation. Now, Hume's going to describe this as follows. He writes, it appears therefore that all virtuous actions derive their merit only from virtuous motives and are considered merely as signs for these motives. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> this uh, explanatory hypothesis is going to have an important uh, consequence. Right. <clears throat> uh, so here, those were those questions. Right. No, I'm here. Uh, it's going to have uh, an important consequence. Um, uh, from it, Hume concludes that the first virtuous motive, which bestows merit on any action, can never be a regard to the virtue of the action, but must be some other natural motive or principle. Okay, what does he mean by a regard to the virtue of the action? Um, I think he just means uh, a kind of generalized sense of duty, right? Suppose you resolve uh, to, to yourself, hey, I'm going to act uh, only as virtue requires, right? Uh, that's going to be kind of very generalized sense of uh, uh, duty. Um, um, but um, uh, here's, the, here's the worry. Uh, if an action drives its merit from the motive that produced it, and the motive that produces a virtuous action uh, 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 is uh, uh, the regard to the virtue of the action. 
and that motive is what's supposed to bestow merit on the action, then you can be puzzled about, well, if the action doesn't yet have merit, right, how can a regard for that merit, right, uh, move you to act in the relevant way? And at first blush, Hume's reasoning seems relatively clear. However, the precise sense in which we might be reasoning in a circle uh, has uh, 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 eluded commentators. Uh, there's, and I'm going to be completely honest with you, there's no general consensus about how to interpret Hume here, and many doubt that Hume has a uh, coherent position. Now, I'm going to sketch the difficulties as I understand them. I'm also going to try to offer you a way out of these difficulties uh, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and we'll see uh, how well Hume's account fares. So what makes an action virtuous? You know, again, consider a candidate virtuous action, repaying a debt owed to a creditor and asking, Again, in asking we, this, we might be asking these questions. Um, what does the merit of repaying a debt consists? Or why is repaying a debt the object of moral approbation? Again, these are the kinds of questions that uh, Hume's explanatory hypothesis meant to answer. Repaying a debt has merit and is the object of moral approbation because of its motivation. It's the action's motivation again, that bestows merit upon it. However, as I emphasized earlier, there's another kind of question that might be asked, an action's only virtuous if it proceeds from a virtuous motive. So if an action lacks a virtuous motive, that action is not virtuous, even if it's the same type of action as a generally virtuous action. And since the same type of action can proceed from different motives, and this makes a difference to our moral evaluation of that action. One might ask of an action of a given type, well, what makes it virtuous? If actions of the same type can vary in virtue, how can we distinguish genuinely virtuous actions from merely, uh, 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 merely apparent, uh, actions that merely appear to be virtuous? Uh, and this gives rise to the second sense of question in asking what makes an action virtuous, he might be asking what makes repaying a debt genuinely virtuous? What repay, which repayments are the objects of moral approbation? And again, these are questions about the objects of ap moral approbation. And these questions are conceptually distinct, but they seem to admit of distinct answers. So consider the regard to the virtue of an action. In acting out of a regard to the virtue of an action, a person acts out of a general non-specific sense of duty, out of a motive to do, you know, whatever virtue requires, a motive to perform whatever action virtue requires might be part of the causal explanation that makes the action genuinely virtuous. And it, Hume seems at one point to give an example of this. And while a regard to the virtue of action might be an answer to the question, what makes an action genuinely virtuous? It couldn't also be an answer to the question, what bestows merit upon an action? And the problem is uh, that a regard to the virtue of an action understood as a motive to do, you know, whatever virtue requires can cause literally any arbitrary action. For any action X, the motive to do whatever virtue requires in conjunction that X, a uh, judgment that X is what virtue requires can cause X. So the regard to the virtue of the action fails to determine which of these arbitrary actions are genu genuinely possess uh, uh, the moral beauty of virtue. Now, the difficulty uh, is that the circularity only seems vicious on the supposition that these distinct questions admit of a single answer. Uh, and so it can seem that either Hume's confused these distinct questions or in overlooking their distinctness, 
Hume has failed to notice an undischarged assumption in his argument. That, in effect, is um, the main challenge, right, to understanding uh, uh, Hume here. We'll come back to this. Uh, I think there, there might be an answer to this question. Okay, uh, so let's grant, at least for the sake of argument, that the virtuous motive couldn't be the regard to the virtue of the action, a sense of duty, since this involves a vicious circularity. Okay, fine. That means there's got to be some independent motive uh, distinct from the sense of duty for a, a virtuous action. Well, what independent motive could this be? Now, Hume's going to consider a certain class of affections. He calls them natural affections. And these are motives that uh, can be found in humans prior to the establishment of society, right? So he doesn't want motives uh, that are the result of human uh, convention, right? Uh, because that would make it an artificial virtue, right? And so he considers three and rejects each. He, in particular, the three natural affections or natural motives he considers are self-love, public benevolence, and private benevolence. Uh, self-love, that's just a natural concern for one's interests. You know, don't think of it as being limited to narcissists. Uh, we all are naturally concerned uh, for our own interests. And self-love, he claims, couldn't be the motive for just action. While there's nothing inherently wrong uh, with acting from uh, self-love, uh, Hume observes that this passion, if unchecked, is the source of injustice. So. Uh, if a person steals to further their own interests, they act unjustly, even though uh, uh, they act from self-love. <clears throat> public benevolence is a uh, natural concern uh, for uh, the public interest. Uh, public benevolence could be the motive for just action. Uh, and Hume gives three reasons. First, as Hume will try to show, while observing the rules of justice is related to the public interest, this relation's indirect and artificial. It's the general scheme established by human convention and not any particular observances of justice that can be contrary to the public good, even though uh, the existence uh, of the convention tends to uh, increase the public good. So justice may require us to repay a debt to a scoundrel who will use these funds in a manner contrary to the public uh, interest. Second, an action can be just even though he says it's carried out in secret. So if the public, but you know, the public can take no interest in an action that a person's moved, uh, uh, that they have no knowledge of. Uh, then it can't be for the sake of public interest that the person's moved to uh, act justly in secret. And third, while public benevolence can move a person to act, uh, he thinks that this motive is going to be too far too weak to explain the widespread observances of uh, um, uh, the conventions of justice. Finally, we've got private benevolence. That's a natural concern for the interests of another person. Private benevolence uh, couldn't be the motive for just action. A person can be motivated to act justly, even though they feel no benevolence towards the uh, uh, relevant party that's concerned. So uh, for example, a person lacks any concern for the interests of an enemy and yet can be motivated to repay uh, a debt owed to that enemy. At least in this instance, the motive to act justly couldn't be, uh, uh, um, uh, couldn't be private uh, benevolence. Okay, so where are we, right? Uh, we know, right, uh, that the uh, motive couldn't be the general sense of duty. Somehow that got us into a circle. We know it couldn't be an independent motive if we restrict ourselves to the natural affections. Now, obviously, Hume hasn't looked at every single natural affection and argued against it. 
Rather, he picked uh, some what he regarded as likely candidates, and uh, and he thinks uh, that look, if these likely candidates aren't going to work, it's probable that none of them are going to work, right? Uh, uh, so Hume concludes after the reasoning that I've just rehearsed for you that uh, uh, justice is an art artificial virtue. And allow me to read a passage for you. He says, from all this, it follows that we naturally have no real or universal motive for observing the laws of equity, it's laws of justice. But the very equity and merit of that observance, uh, and, and, and as no action can be uh, equitable or meritous, uh, where it cannot arise from some separate motive, there, there's here an evident sophistry and reasoning in a circle, unless, therefore, uh, we will allow uh, that nature has established a sophistry and rendered it necessary and unavoidable, we must allow that the sense of justice and injustice is not derived from nature, but arises artificially, though necessarily from education and human convention. Now, again, Hume's reasoning is difficult to interpret. Uh, you know, uh, one might worry if nature couldn't establish a sophistry, how could human artifice? Well, look, I, in here, let me just speculate how Hume might be understood here. Um, first, uh, notice that with respect to the natural virtues, uh, the motive to virtuous action is what bestows merit upon that action. So again, consider kindness to children. When you feed a hungry child, the motive is kindness, and it's the amiableness of that action. It's being motivated by kindness uh, that bestows merit upon the action uh, and makes it the object of moral approbation. So notice that one, natural virtues uh, or naturally virtuous actions have merit and are the objects of moral approbation in so far as they're motivated in the right sort of way. And two, it's their being so motivated that bestows merit upon them and makes them the object of approbation. So if justice were a natural virtue, justice, just actions would have merit and be the object of moral approbation insofar as they're motivated in the right sort of way. And it's their being motivated in this way uh, that would bestow merit and, and make them the object of approbation. And however, just actions don't satisfy these two conditions. What could the relevant motive be? Well, a regard to the justice of an action can motivate a person in a civilized state to act justly. It couldn't bestow merit upon that action. Moreover, no independently specified natural motive, such as self-love, public and private benevolence, could be the motive for just action. And since justice doesn't satisfy these two conditions, justice could not be a natural virtue. While a regard to the justice of an action might be an answer to what makes an action genuinely just, it could not also be an answer to the question, what bestows merit upon just actions and makes it the object of uh, moral approbation. Again, you can only have regard to the virtue of an action if something already has virtue, right? So it can't be, that can't be the thing that's making it virtuous. Uh, now, earlier, I, I worried that there was an alleged incoherence in reasoning in a circle on uh, the supposition uh, that these distinct questions admit of a single answer. Uh, and again, the worry was, uh, uh, it can seem either as if Hume has uh, confused these distinctions or that in overlooking their distinctness, Hume's failed to notice an undischarged assumption in his argument. Um, um, uh, well, on the present reading, Hume's guilty of neither 
it's the assumption that justice is a natural virtue, right? Assume for the sake of reductio uh, that commits one to the claim that these two questions admit of a single uh, answer. So um, I understand this argument is complex. Uh, and I also understand uh, that there's this interpretive difficulty in exactly how to understand this argument. But despite its complexity and despite the difficulty in understanding it, it's been an influential argument. Uh, so for example, um, uh, Christine Korsgaard, uh, a Kantian, right, has tried to uh, drive some important lessons from, from this argument. Uh, uh, now, um, and uh, the main takeaway, well, the main things we want to take away from it is sort of learn it, what we learn about the nature of the natural virtues and, uh, uh, um, and uh, I think if you just held in mind these two conditions that natural virtues uh, uh, have merit insofar as they're motivated in the right sort of way and their motivation bestows merit upon that action. Focus on those two conditions. The argument is in effect can be understood that justice fails to satisfy those two conditions. Uh, if natural virtues satisfies these two conditions and justice does not, it follows that justice is not a natural virtue. So that's, I think, the, the easiest sort of way uh, to summarize, as it were, the main point of uh, this uh, 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 argument. Um, now, uh, so that's going to complete Hume's case for justice not being a, a natural virtue. Next time, we're going to look at Hume's positive account of justice. And this is really interesting uh, material for those of you who go on to study uh, uh, pol political philosophy and will learn about Hobbes and R Rousseau. This will be directly uh, relevant uh, to that. Um, and again, it's really important to notice that Hume's account is going to fall into two parts, right? It's going to first talk about a genealogy of justice. He's going to talk about the uh, original motive that first established the conventions of justice, right? And then he's going to give a separate account of what bestows merit upon just actions. And again, if you look at these two conditions, right, and how no one thing can satisfy it, that's going to be reflected in the structure of uh, Hume's account, okay? So, uh, uh, <clears throat> so next time, again, uh, we'll uh, be looking at Hume's uh, positive uh, account, um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and the important thing for you to bear in mind is how the two-stage structure of his account, right, maps onto this earlier discussion about why justice is not a natural uh, uh, virtue. I will remind you of the connections again uh, next time. Uh, but for now, I think, I think that's uh, all that I have for today. Uh, thank you for uh, listening and we'll uh, see you uh, uh, next week. Thanks very much.